For the past four years of my life, bro, I have been sitting here patiently waiting for the day I finally get to meet all the upper moons, bro. Like, real sh The writers have basically spent damn near the last half a decade at this point gassing these niggas up, bro. Like, I swear, ever since the Rengoku movie, they had me thinking the upper moons were gonna be like that, bro. Well, as of last Sunday, my wish finally came true. I finally got to meet all the upper moons. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great sorrow that I report to you that these niggas are some f***ing clowns, bro. Like, I'm not gonna lie, bro. Muzan gotta be the worst villain recruiter of all time, bro. Because what the f*** is this squad, bro? You had 113 years to put together an absolute unit of demons, bro. And this gaggle of bozos is the best lineup you could come out with. Bro, you give me 113 years to recruit, and I'm popping out with the most demonic team of generational felons you have ever seen in your life. Because no way Muzan had well over a century to build a squadron of his right-hand men. And this fat dome bum is still on the team. Like, how did he make it through 113 years of cuts, bro? I'll deadass throw b Lady in the mix before I let Coconut Head over here get any type of time on the field. Anyway, this scene starts off with my favorite... Nope, 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 nope. Scratch that. My ex-favorite upper moon pulling up in Muzan's little pocket dimension since Muzan called for like a team meeting or whatever. First of all, okay, I gotta give credit where it's due. This probably gotta be the coldest villain hideout in all of history, bro. I can't even lie. This is how I know Muzan is really mad greedy, bro, because if I'm Muzan and I somehow have a mystical palace all to myself, why am I risking it all to go squabble with some teenagers, bro? That's very dumb. I'm gonna just be in there. I don't know, chilling with Biwa lady, playing Connect Four or some shit. I don't know. Anyway, Oxa pulls up at the meeting, and off rip, we finally get to see Upper Five and Upper Four. And honestly, I wish we never got to see these niggas in the first place, bro, because these gotta be the ugliest niggas in history, bro. Like, I'm not gonna lie, if I was a Hashira, and one of these two hideous ass Upper Moons pulled up on me, I'd probably just demon slay myself at that point, because I'll be damned if I got a box upper four and my knuckles accidentally brush up against his forehead lump like ill bro anyway these three are all sitting here right waiting for moves on having small talk or whatever when all of a sudden the lights cut out like it's a cardi concert or something this is when things really started going downhill for the boy oxa because doma pulls up and he basically just starts like little broing oxa he's like damn bro i heard you almost got solo by hashra bro is that true damn that's crazy couldn't be me no, i'm not gonna lie Oxa teed up at first and he really popped this man Doma dead in the jaw till half of his face blew up off his body but you know Doma's an upper moon too so he really eats those and got right back to cooking this man Oxa and this is when I really started looking Oxa sideways because I remember he was talking a whole lot of shit to the boy Rengoku rest in peace now it's finally time for him to pick on somebody his own size and he don't got shit to say now that is very interesting to me anywho the boy Muzan pops up doing like an upside down chemistry set or something and basically starts cooking all these upper bums one by one. Basically talking about how inadequate they are. Whole time, I'm just wondering, bro, isn't this the team you recruited? Like, are these not your hand-picked goons? Like, if you want to get mad at somebody, get mad at yourself for being the worst villain leader in anime history, bro, because you had 113 years to lock in, so I don't want to hear it now. Nah, but there's some definite favoritism going on in these upper ranks, bro, because I noticed that Muzan... He lets Upper 1 and Upper 2 talk back to him. He damn near lets Upper 1 press him. When my boy Upper 5 comes up out of the pot trying to give Muzan some actual valuable information about how to defeat his ops, now the boy Muzan wants to start hating and proceeds to behead him and then throw him back on the ground like some literal dumpster trash, bro. Nah, it, it was kind of funny though just watching this nigga's head fall like five stories and then just casually splat on the ground. Anyway, Muzan leaves and goes to do whatever Muzan does in his spare time and then the boy Doma pops up and starts trolling Oxa again but this time upper one gets in the mix too and he really bucks up on Oxa bro he's like bro don't touch my man's Doma because we can both really beat the stripes off your ugly ass bro and Oxa can't even do anything but sit there and seethe because he knows that the upper one aka Kokushibo is really like that too like he could tell this ain't no regular Rengoku type sword play he's coming with bro because he really chopped off that boy Oxa's arm like it was deli meat bro like it was actually very wicked and evil but nah when they finally showed this Kokushibo's face bro I won't even cap I got a little jump scare because why does he have six fat ass eyes all squished on his face back to back to back like that bro like what the f does he need all that damn vision for, bro? Talking about, oh, Uba Yashiki's a master of concealing himself. I can't find him. Yes, the f you can. All that damn vision, all them damn eyes on your face. Stop playing with me, bro. 
Now I know the boy Tondro is no stranger to getting beat the fuck up, but this gotta be a new low for my boy because up until this past Sunday, at least bro could honestly say he was only getting his ass beat by living things. Now if he said that sh he would be a damn liar because bro has officially accomplished the feat of being dropped off by an inanimate object. Now I'm not gonna lie, I knew Mr. Felonbot9000 over here was on a different type of timing when I saw it running a fair fade with a Hashira, but this shit is absolutely bonkers, bro. Like who the f built this shit, bro? Tony Stark? How the f is a training doll actually this OP? And better yet, why are you even using this cracked ass puppet as a training dummy? Bro clearly has more skill than 99% of the demon slayers out there, bro. If I'm Ubi Ashiki, I'm cooking up 10,000 of these hoes and deploying all of them sh to the field expeditiously. Like that boy Muzan's about to be real sick when he realized I flipped this whole sh into a bot lobby, bro. Stop playing with me. But nah, I'm not gonna lie. I have a personal fan theory that this robot was secretly constructed via blood demon art because no way y'all genuinely expect me to believe that this advanced ass diabolical ass robot runs off a of hand cranking wooden gears. Like be very for real right now, bro. In 2023, we can barely get robots to stand on two feet without busting their ass. And you expect me to believe some random in 1606 who probably thought the earth was flat built this aggressive ass bionicle y'all know about bionicles bro anyway tanjiro starts squabbling with this goddamn fnaf robot right and without hesitation fella in bot 9000 just starts beating the buns off tanjiro like first of all instead of swords that got bro armed with some damn two by four wooden planks presumably so tanjiro doesn't lose his life when this robot inevitably cracks him in his ass personally I'm just sitting here wondering how the f this robot is so damn advanced, bro. Like, they got this sh running on that new chat GPT-4, huh? Because that's the only way a random-ass dog could possibly be this busted for no reason, bro. But back to Tanjiro, though. Not only is he over here getting his ass fried by Megatron Jr., but while all this is going on, there's also this annoying-ass little kid named Kotetsu over there chilling on the sidelines, needlessly hating on Tanjiro's grind for no reason, bro. Like, there's this exchange where the Orichi bot puts the moves on Tanjiro and strikes him dead in the stomach. And while Tanjiro's on the ground, writhing in pain and agony from this attack this little kid runs up and just starts full force pressing my boy for no reason and you know what i'm gonna be honest this kid was low-key giving tanjiro some genuinely good advice about how to improve his fighting style but i don't know how i feel about this little kid talking crazy to my boy tanjiro like that because if bro thinks he's really cold like that that he's ready to start talking and is reckless while training them then when the upper moons come slide on the village in the next episode or two i better see old kotetsu up in the mix giving out squabbles bro since he's really like that now allegedly i don't know bro something just rubbed me the wrong way watching this little kid swear up and down that he's tanjiro sensei when he knows good and damn well he hasn't slain a single demon in the entirety of his life and like the thing about kotetsu no way this nigga started playing copyrighted music while i'm and like the thing about kotetsu is that bro really started stepping way out of pocket at a certain point because what made him think it was at all appropriate to ban my boy Tanjiro from eating food for literally days on end? Like, I'm not gonna lie. If I'm Tanjiro right there, that's where I draw the line. You're either gonna give me my food or you're gonna catch these Hinokami strokes to the top of your head because now you're doing too much. Like, bro, when you think about it, that's really vile behavior from a child, bro. Like, he had my boy Tanjiro out there looking like his sick-ass pops. In fact, he damn near sent Tanjiro up to heaven to meet his pops. But, you know, Tanjiro, he's a all-star status at evading death. So, he basically just revived himself and then proceeded to spawn back in with some new bullshit-ass abilities. Like, you know, Tanjiro's always been able to physically smell abstract concepts like anger and dishonesty and a bunch of other things that he should literally never be capable of smelling in his life well get a load of this now bro can literally smell predict where his enemies are going to attack him before it even happens like you know how there's some characters that have future sight well this nigga literally has unlocked future smell now i'm going to give the writers the benefit of the doubt and say that tanjiro is just using the word smell as like a metaphor for like general extrasensory perception type abilities because if you expect me to believe that this man can smell with his nose literal attack patterns then at this point he's got to be a hacker cheater because how does that make any sense whatsoever i'm sorry anyway after getting some food on his stomach and unlocking his new hacks tanjiro is finally able to put up a fair fade with the robot and after doing a little jump spin and having a whole conversation with kotetsu in midair he finally gets a strike in on the robot and takes the robot's dome off now once this robot has been beheaded by tanjiro it's actually revealed that there was a hidden sword within like the robot's chassis and correct me if i'm wrong but i think this is supposed to be like tanjiro's chosen sword 
my only question is is it really though because tanjiro done burnt through about three chosen swords at this point like he's really wasteful as shit with it too like he really didn't have to throw a whole sword in ox's sternum bro just because he had a little rage moment like there were rocks on the ground or some shit could have picked up bro like bro the whole premise of this arc is that this nigga breaks and loses swords so much that they had to send bro by himself to the sword factory so that he could cop a new one fresh off the iron bro like that's really crazy bro i'm not gonna lie if i was his swordsmith i would be hiding from him too because why am i cooking this nigga four swords over the course of three seasons like bro just take two with you next time when you go because i don't want to see your ass back here till at least midway through season five bro come on now now normally when someone gets caught lacking in demon slayer i can kind of let it slide because a lot of the times the demon slayers be getting put into these bullshit ass fights that they were low-key destined to lose from the jump perfect example Rengoku during the Mugen Train arc. Like, Akusa knows his big buff body ass had no business popping up on them like that at the end of the movie. Like, he was really dead wrong for jumping them like that, bro. Like, that wasn't cool. With that said, though, I can't let what happened in last week's episode slide, bro, because there is no excuse for these advanced ass Hashira to be displaying the level of lackery that I just witnessed. Like, Tanjiro. I'm not gonna lie. Origami cranes, bro. Are you dead ass right now? Is this really the best usage of your time while Muzan is still at large and committing felonies on a daily basis? Like there is a whole upper moon demon on the prowl right now making origami out of real life innocent people. And you think you got time to make paper cranes and take naps with Nezuko? Crazy part is, that wasn't even like a regular nap either. That it was an immense slumber. Like if Muchido didn't come press bro, I honestly think he probably would have just slept through the entire scrap because bro was out. The thing that confused me the most about this whole ordeal though is the fact that even after everyone was awake and alert, they still couldn't detect a whole super demon until he was right outside their door. Like I'm sorry, but you trying to tell me that old nostrils over here can literally smell an enemy's attack before it happens, but he can't smell the must of upper forest 376 year old demon buns crawling down the hall with devious intent? That math simply does not add up. Like, bro, this shit was really embarrassing when you think about it. Cause no way y'all let a whole upper moon walk y'all down like that. Like, he just casually opened the front door and let himself in. Like, bro really walked into the room mad timid too. He looked like he was about to tell his mom that he got suspended from school or something. Anyway, I know I've been flaming the Slayers for this whole video so far, but I gotta give credit where it's due, okay? Because the moment the boy Muchiro saw Hantengu's strong dome ass start crawling into the room, he was on go time. He got right to work hitting him with that mist breathing fourth form. And like, I'm not gonna lie, he hit that shit so smooth, you would have almost thought he really didn't just get caught lacking right there. Unfortunately for him though, Hantengu was never lacking in the first place and he weaved the shit out of Muchiro's attack. I mean, to be fair, Hantengu was bleeding a little, so I think Muchiro might have tagged his little coconut or something. But honestly, I don't know if that's really an accomplishment though, since I feel like that's kind of a hard target to miss. Anywho, through the power of jumping and yeah, Tanjiro, Nezuko, and Muchido managed to take off Upper Four's head pretty quickly. The problem is, though, it was to the point where, like, you knew some dumb shit was about to happen, bro, because no way they soloed a whole Upper Moon in under 30 seconds. And, yeah, lo and behold, when Muchido split Upper Four's body in two, instead of just, you know, dying like a normal nigga, Hantengu decided to use what I'm assuming is his blood demon art to literally split into two distinct entities, each with their own personalities and abilities and yeah you get the point miss tashira actually tries to jump one of the clones by like speed blitzing them but leaf tengu really isn't with that sneaky shit. so he basically just turns to the last airbender and blast muchiro's little goofy ass all the way to kingdom come this is when shit started looking real dark for tanjiro bro because i knew the moment they got muchiro up out the way it was time for tanjiro's yearly ass whooping bro personally i thought he had paid his dues when felon bot mixed this shit a couple episodes ago but I guess not because those clone Tengus were really on his ass, bruh. The nigga shop Tengu put that boy in the electric chair. The nigga bird Tengu scooped him up like a worm and proceeded to hypersonic screech in his ears. Like, that is so disrespectful and uncalled for. At this point, I gotta give it to Tanjiro for even having the willpower to continue constantly boxing these demons, bruh. Because I swear he just got out of a coma like five days ago and it's looking like he's on the fast track to another one already. Anyway, um, where the f did this nigga get a demon blick from? See, this is the shit to be confusing me about the Demon Slayer core. I don't think they're really serious about trying to defeat Muzan, bruh. Because if they were really locked in, every Slayer in this organization would be armed with a demon blick, bro. We just watched those Nietzschean bullets rip through literal upper moon flesh, bro. With that in mind, it can be reasonably assumed that 99.9% .9 of demons can be handled with firearms. Like, bro, 
Sorus Myth Village. I'm really rooting for the demons now because y'all need to really get with the times. Like, I hope the demons burn this whole village to the ground and y'all realize how stupid this whole shit was and just import some guns because this is just a ridiculous level of lacquery at this point. Now, I'm not a big weapons guy, so I had to like do some research on the type of guns that the Slayers would have had available to them at the time in which this show takes place. Bro. They had Tommy guns. Listen, I don't care what your blood demon art is, bruh. I don't care what upper rank you are. You throw me in Demon Slayer, and these Tommy bullets are finna eat your ass up before you can even activate your sh Like, I'm not gonna lie. You throw me in Demon Slayer with a drum gun, and I'm putting up a Hashira level kill streak by the end of the week. You throw a sniper in there too, and I'll have you Muzan's head by next Tuesday because the time has come, bro. Too many lives have been lost for y'all to still be playing around trying to sword fight these niggas, bro. Come on, lock in. You know how some anime have those characters that are just constantly uncovering groundbreaking new ways to take L's? Like no matter how hard they try, no matter what the circumstances are coming into the fight, they will, without fail, by some miracle of God, always find a way to get that ass mopped by the end of the fight? Yeah, I'm not even gonna lie. I thought that's what Genya was gonna be for Demon Slayer, cause look, everything we had seen from this man up until last week's episode was simply an indisputable L. Like this his first appearance in the show was literally him getting pressed by Tanjiro to the point where Tanjiro fractured his arm. I'm not gonna lie, how do you get pressed by Tanjiro bruh? Like that nigga is nice as sh Bro doesn't even really press the demons for real, he kinda just says prayers for them and sh Nah, for real though, I think Tanjiro might have actually up Genya's bag when he broke his arm though bro because look I noticed the boy Genya doesn't really use breathing styles like that and I'm wondering if it's because his arm can't handle that type of pressure after Tanjiro obliterated his sh anywho when I came in episode 4 the last thing I expected to see was Bakugo Jr of all people putting up numbers on the scoreboard but lo and behold that boy Genya is actually kind of tough you see the reason I assumed Genya was some straight buns off the rip was because of that abysmal performance that he put up in episode 3 bro literally tried to run up on three demons like a f***ing Dorcas and so of course he ended up just getting stabbed dead in the stomach before he could even do anything like when I saw that I was really like okay this dude is clearly just dumb so rest in peace I guess where's Mitsuri at now look I'll be the first to admit Genya proved me wrong because yes he did get stabbed in this sh but the scrap was far from over. Cause when Sad Tengu tried to pull the spear out of Genya's guts, pause, old Genya was not about to let that shit happen. Like bro, I don't know what type of ab exercises they train these demon slayers with, but these niggas core strength is absolutely astonishing bro. Because this isn't even the first time a demon stuck some shit inside of a demon slayer's stomach and couldn't pull it back out. Pause. Anyway, Sad Tengu is so busy trying to dislodge his spear from Genya's swole ass, he doesn't even realize that bro still got that stick on him, and so while Sad Tengu is distracted, Genya takes his chance to catch that boy lacking and blast his dome off. I'm not gonna lie, Genya was low-key pretty close to catching the W here, but you know, Upper Moon's always gotta be on some OP-ass, hacker-cheater bullshit, bro. So of course Sad Tengu, with his head hanging onto his neck by a literal thread, might I add, finally manages to pull his spear out of Genya's torso, man. <laughs> Yeah, that's not looking too good for bro after that. Now at this point, even though he's over there slumped in a pool of his own blood, everybody's gotta give Genya his respect, bro. I gotta give him his respect, you gotta give him his respect, the demons gotta give him his respect. Bro, it's to the point where Shot Tingu is literally talking to his mans like, bro, please hurry up and kill this dude with your sad ass, cause he's gonna dead ass be a problem if you don't drop him right now. And Sad Tingu knows good and damn well he's about to be a problem too, so he's like, yeah, you know what, you're right, let me, let me go ahead and get this man up out of here before he reloads and shit. So Sad Tingu turns around to finish off Genya, but when he does, this man Genya has his hand over his heart, and he's like, chanting some shit. Now, I'm not gonna lie, when I first watched this, I thought Genya was ready to drop a vicious ass incantation on these demons, bruh. Like, I thought he was really about to be the first human to ever activate blood demon art. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> But come to find out, the boy Genya is actually reciting a Buddhist chant here. Now, when I first heard that info, I was like, oh, okay, like, yeah, that's cool. That's a cool little detail for them to add in there. Like, you know, Genya's religious or whatever. He's a Buddhist. But then I really stopped to think about the ramifications of the information I just learned. Bro, think about it. This is literally putting the scrap on God. He's really dropping scriptures on y'all before he gets in that ass. Like, that's really crazy. That's like if I'm about to cook your ass, but before I knock you in your shit, I hit you with the Our Father, who art in heaven. Like, come on, bruh. Putting your God's name on the scrap just brings it to a whole new level. Like, if that shit wasn't serious before, it just got real serious now. And like, I think Genya would agree with me too because that man got serious. The boy Sad Tengu tries to finish Genya off with a final blow, but Genya some- mm, Genya, what the f- 
I'm tweaking. The boy Sad Tengu tries to finish Genya off with the final blow, but Genya somehow weaves his sh and speed blitzes behind him. Of course, the demons are still on cheater mode though, and so Shock Tengu sneaks Genya with one of them busted ass lightning attacks. Unfortunately for Shock Tengu though, Genya can still twitch that trigger finger just enough, and so mid electrocution, he lets Shock Tengu get a taste of them hollows and blows his wrist straight into oblivion, bruh. But alas, as much as Genya's snapping right now, he's still kind of like getting jumped and sh And so Sad Tengu hits him with a berry bonds to the ribs and basically launches my get through the wall into the next room over. Now at this point, Sad Tengu walks into the room and he's like, okay, this kid's gotta be dead now. And honestly, I was right there with him thinking the same thing because like there is no way this man survives all that, bro. Like if he's still kicking, we're looking at main character levels of plot armor now because this is getting out of hand. Uh, yeah, nah, he, he's not dead. In fact, I got a feeling that he's low-key just getting started because this man stood up, looked sad Tengu dead in the eyes, and dropped his first and last name on him. Now, y'all know what time it is when a in anime drops his government name on you and tells you to remember it. They're about to get in that ass, bruh. And look, with the way Genya was letting them bullets rip this episode, if I was sad Tengu, I don't really know if I'd even want this his maniacal ass smoke, bruh, because, <laughs> yo, that shit look painful. But, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. You know, after last week's episode of Demon Slayer, I can low-key see why these demons hate Tanjiro so much, bro. Like, I can really see why Muzan wants to get this kid up off the map. Like, it's not even just the fact that Tanjiro has killed countless demons at this point. I mean, to be fair, that's probably a large part of it. But it's the fact that this dude Tanjiro will really fry your ass with no warning whatsoever and no prior indication of him being able to do so. Like, think of it from the demon's perspective, bruh. They're over here beating the buns off this nigga for three straight episodes. Then him and his sister suddenly disappear for like 25 seconds. And when they finally see him again, before they can even mentally process what's going on, he fucking blazes them in 4K, 60 FPS, 10 trillion dollar budget sakuga animation now they gotta live the rest of their lives with the footage of them getting their ass toasted immortalized in mad amvs and mad tiktok edits like just won't even remember the cool shit they did anymore they'll just forever be associated with that one time they got their ass cooked by this beautiful ass attack but nah for once i'm actually gonna relax on the hating just for a sec because despite how broken this attack was i can't lie this scene was amazing bro absolutely gorgeous easily my favorite scene of the season thus far like this scene alone almost made me forgive you foldable for finessing me during that little theatrical release scam they pulled a few months ago almost we're still beefing though and i'm still pressing charges to get my money back for that bullshit ass movie like the video if you want to get in on the settlement funds but now nah, when i say this get back came out of nowhere i really mean it came out of nowhere bruh because this scene actually started with tanjiro getting that ass abused by the tengu trio like i'm not gonna lie they definitely did not give that boy tanjiro the decency and respect of a one-on-one -on -one. because as a unit they were basically just spamming attacks on him and his sister bruh like it was honestly a sad sight to see they had them out there getting tapped with lightning bolts wind blast uh bird attacks <laughs> I don't know, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Bird Tengu gotta be the weakest link in this whole squad. But anyway, Tanjiro and Nezuko were getting walloped to the point where for a second, I was genuinely curious about how they were gonna manage to pull through. Like I thought Tanjiro was gonna have to really dig deep and strategize to make some shit happen. And then I saw Nezuko pop out with the pink flames. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I see what's going on here. They're not gonna strategize. They're gonna cheat their way to victory. Cause bruh, let me tell you, whenever Nezuko activates these pink flames, bruh, it's over, bro. You already know some hacker cheater bullshit is about to go down. Because these flames are literally undefeated, bro. Like as long as Nezuko has access to this bullshit ability, that nigga Tanjiro will never, and I mean never, have to face the consequences of his actions. Like these flames are quite literally plot armor incarnate. Anyway, as if the fing Nezuko cheat codes weren't enough already. Tanjiro decides to double down and stack on another plot armor multiplier. And like he always does, this guy activates dead sibling flashbacks. But nah, I'm not gonna lie though. This shit was actually funny as hell because I think the boy Tanjiro really used up all of his dead sibling flashbacks. Cause tell me why when he tried to activate them, he ended up seeing Yorichi's dead sister instead of his own. It's like he spammed that shit so often over the past three seasons, his own siblings don't even got shit else inspirational to say to him anymore. So they had to like call in backup from another his dead family but nah as tanjiro was getting more flashbacks from yorichi i think bro loki started to realize he was the main character of this whole shit because it's like he kind of started to put the puzzle pieces together for real like he was literally sitting there in the show like loki breaking the fourth wall like damn me and this yorichi guy we sure do have a lot in common huh maybe just maybe i'm him 
And it's like, even if Tanjiro didn't fully realize he was the MC yet, I think the Tengu trio definitely did because they started having them vicious ass Muzan PTSD flashbacks right before Tanjiro smacked them in the back of their neck with the meanest three piece combo they had ever seen in their lives. Like I'm not gonna lie, that boy Tanjiro was really putting in work with that combo. However, I can't let this Rengoku disrespect go unchecked, bro. Cause tell me why when Tanjiro was having a flashback to all the people that had helped him along his journey, he really relegated my Rengoku to the tiniest, teensiest, tiniest little edge of the frame. Like the most minuscule little corner of the fabric of his cape was the only thing visible on the screen. Like I genuinely thought my screen had cut off or something, but nah, Tanjiro was just being mad petty right there. Like I'm not gonna lie, Tanjiro, you're really dead wrong for this shit right here because out of all the people in this screen right now, Rengoku is really the only one who laid down his life for you bruh and then it's like the disrespect doesn't even stop there because after doing my man Rengoku dirty like this you had the nerve the absolute audacity to hit these demons with the flame dragon based attack knowing good and damn well Rengoku stamped that shit first during the Oxa fight way back in 2021 like you really stole my man's esoteric art bar for bar and then just rebranded it and added a little bit of pink flames to the mix to make it look pretty like we all know Rengoku ran that shit first bruh stop playing bro yo ass is not slick i'm not gonna lie bruh at this point if i'm rengoku tanjiro is gonna have to catch this fade the moment he crosses the pearly gates bruh like i'm really gonna bust him in this sh too because think about it there's no hacks up in heaven no cheats up in heaven there's no way he'll be able to flash back to his dead siblings when we're both already dead think about it back when i was a kid if i was ever like crying over some dumb sh my mom would remind me that I should really just be grateful for what I had because there was probably someone out there who had it way worse than I did. And you know, W mom's for real because even to this day, I try to adopt that mindset whenever I'm faced with a problem. For example, I'll be like, yeah, this history essay is hard as shit. But you know what's even harder as shit? Fucking shrapnel. And I don't ever have to worry about getting hit with shrapnel, so you know, in the grand scheme of things, I'll be alright. With that said, Tanjiro. I'm sorry, but I don't ever want to see you flash back to your backstory ever again, bro, because I'm not gonna lie, bro, we got a new saddest backstory in town, and that shit belongs to the boy Genya. Actually, I feel like Sonami definitely had it worse, but at least Sonami became cool as f because of his backstory. Genya just became a shooter. Now, I'm not trying to be the guy to like trauma compare these niggas, but the reason I feel like Genya's backstory stands out so much compared to Tanjiro's is because when you really stop to think about it, these two essentially have the same backstory. Like the only difference between Genya's backstory and Tanjiro's backstory is that every redeeming factor that Tanjiro had in his tragedy, Genya simply does not have. Like okay, Genya's backstory scene literally starts off with them laying down the groundwork for the boy Genya to just have a shitty ass life. Like we find out that Genya's dad was an abusive asshole who used to just beat on his wife and kids and like, I don't know if I'm the only one who noticed this, but that his calves were yoked Damn. as f like his strong leg ass really could have been out there on the field kicking demons in the chin and saving the day and sh but nah he decided to dedicate all that damn leg meat to kicking innocent women and children like bro i'm not gonna lie what's with all these fathers and demon slayer being horrific l's like not even just usual anime father l's like horrific genuinely horrible people in every sense of the word anyway we get an unspecified time skip and we're suddenly taken to the fateful night the night where Genya's life was about to become solidified as some straight buns for the rest of eternity. Long story short bruh, Genya's mom somehow got turned into a demon and so she pulls up at the crib in the middle of the night and basically goes 5 for 7 at killing her own children. One shot might I add. Now if you do the math, that means she shot 71% from the field and so we're clear, these stats actually put her above that bum ass Muzan who only put up 54% at close range on Tanjiro's family. Nah, I'm playing. They both went 5 for 7. But that's still embarrassing for Muzan, bruh, because no way the quote-unquote Demon King should be putting up the same number of kills as a demon who had presumably only transformed to a demon like 6 hours ago. Crazy part is, Genya probably would have gotten his ass smoked as well had it not been for his older brother Sonami. And let me just take this moment right here to say, that boy Sonami is different. Like, yeah, I probably could have predicted that since, you know, he's the whole white hair sibling in a family full of black hair niggas, and y'all know how that shit goes in anime, but nah. I genuinely think this man was born simply and only to kill demons, because tell me how bro was able to linebacker body check a whole demon, and then proceed to scrap with this demon the entire night armed with nothing but a goddamn kitchen knife. 
Like, bro didn't have no training. He didn't have no type of breathing styles. Bro just had bare knuckles and vibes, and he managed to get busy on a whole demon. Like, think about how crazy this fight had to be from Sonami's perspective, bro. He's over here fighting this regenerating monster that he's never seen or heard of before. I know at some point he realized it was his own mom, and so that shit was probably crazy to him. And so now he's over here giving ones to his mom for hours on end until the sun finally comes up. And when it finally does come up, he watches his mom evaporate into the nether as his ungrateful ass little brother starts to press him for killing their mom. Like, I'm not gonna lie bro i can see why this man sonomy went crazy and turned to a tweakster bro because honestly i'd probably do the same my damn self let's just be totally honest here but anyway moving back to genya's perspective for a bit i want you to take a second to really think about how tragic this shit is for genya compared to tanjiro because like i said earlier there are three main upsides or redeeming factors if you will that make tanjiro's backstory a bit more bearable and i feel like the writer went out of their way to just not give genya any of the same leeway in any capacity so yeah let's uh let's take a look at these redeeming factors Factor number one, Tanjiro didn't have to actually see his family die. He just saw the aftermath. Genya, on the other hand, he had to watch his shit happen in real time, and he was considerably younger than Tanjiro was. Factor number two, despite their tragedy, Tanjiro and Nezuko still have a healthy relationship and bond. Sanami and Genya? Mm -mm. And finally, factor number three, perhaps the biggest injustice of them all, at least Tanjiro can use his flashbacks as a catalyst for power-ups and revives and all that bullshit. The boy Genya? He doesn't get shit from his flashbacks. He didn't even get basic breathing techniques. All he gets is constant humiliation because no way my a tiny Tengu should have been putting the moves on Genya like that. Like he really put the jets on that boy too. Like that little nigga was moving. This was honestly the funniest shit I ever seen in my life, bro. Like that <laughs> Tengu as a whole is just so goofy, bro. Like, bro. Now when I first saw him Tengu at the beginning of season three, I mean. Y'all remember how I was acting, bro. I was on his ass. I said he had a blue lock soccer ball on the top of his head. I said his hairline was receding crazy and he needed to let it go. I said his breath probably smelled like Yoko's left tongue. I said his joints were so busted that he got diagnosed with arthritis too. I said... <laughs> arthritis too. <laughs> Nah, I'm playing. I barely even said any of that stuff. Honestly, I just needed another reason to fry Hentengu real quick, but look. I don't know how many goddamn okie doke transformations this man Hentengu got up his sleeve, but let this be the last time I gotta deal with this nigga splitting up or recombining himself back into a new transformation, because like, I'm not gonna lie, it was cool the first 17 times, but at this point, you're just spamming, bro. Like, you just making up forms as you go now, huh? Like, bro, I swear I haven't seen a villain go through this many transformations in one arc since Kid Boo and the Boo Saga back in 95. In fact, since you like to transform on this so much, from here on out, your new name is gonna be Diet Boo. Nah, I'm not gonna do him like that. He's ripping a little too hard for me to disrespect him like that, bro. I know y'all seen the solid gold on his fit, but I'm not gonna lie. I know that boy Tanjiro was about mad as hell when he saw him hit that transformation, bro. Like, I wanna talk about how Hentengu really switched it up and flipped the script on Tanjiro. So the scene starts off with our boy Tanjiro locked in. Blade to the back of Tiny Tengu's neck. Honestly, I thought this was it right here, bro. Like, I thought Tanjiro was really about to get Han Tengu up out of there. Because look, bro, we had already hit all the essential checkpoints for a Tanjiro victory. Flashback? Check. Side character sacrifice? Check. Bullshit power up check 50 billion dollar budget animation scene of tanjiro frying his ops with a bunch of pink flames and sparkles and beautiful shit going everywhere check like if we're going by normal demon slayer rules all this alone should have been enough to grab the victory like what else do we need someone to die if that's the case i'm not gonna lie y'all can go ahead and grab genya then because like genya i love you bro you're low-key my favorite character at this point but i'm gonna keep it real you eat your ops that's not okay. Like, I feel like that's gotta be against the rules, too. Like, does Ubu Yashiki know about all the freakazoid shit you be doing, bro? Just asking. Anywho, Tanjiro's over here about to smooth send Hantengu to hell when he suddenly senses this insane felony intent behind him. Turns out, the boy shock Tengu sucked up. Mmm rephrase turns out the boy shock tingu absorbed his brothers like evil boo in order to reach his final form and you know what i'll give this form credit where it's due he most definitely put that shit on though like this can't be the same hand tingu i was grilling at the beginning of the video because i refuse to believe that his fat dome ass can throw a fit on in fact he stole that drip out of doma's closet didn't he thought he was slick with it too anyway which one of y'all watching want to come clean and provide an explanation for why you decided to slide this get hentengu some hashirama cells when we weren't looking because i don't care what you say there's no reason this man hentengu should be coming hot off the spawn point randomly throwing around wood release dragons like come on now the power creep with these demons is low-key insane bruh because we went from bird claws and lightning that literally never hits his target to literal massive skyscraper sized hydro dragons that can eviscerate you in a single bite like i'm gonna be real with you tanjiro was definitely not ready 
need for this level of smoke right now because those wood dragons were on his ass. Like if Nezuko hadn't come to bail him out like she always does, his ass would have been a goner. And Genya? I ain't even gonna lie, bruh. Put the gun down. It's over. Like, I don't know. Maybe Sonami was right and you just weren't built for this. Like, yeah, you. Oh, yo, yo. Why are you still reloading the gun, bruh? It's over. I think the funniest thing about Hentengu is his head. But the second funniest thing is definitely the fact that bro is the first anime villain I've seen really hit the pro tag back with their same energy. Like you wanna jump him? Bet, he's finna split up and jump that ass right back. You wanna try to ass pull a new power on him out of nowhere? Say that, he got an ass pull for you too. Like I'm not gonna lie, the combined energy of his drip and his clap back low-key had me thinking the boy Drip Tengu was really about to be cold. Like I was like, okay, we really witnessed this man and Tengu come up out the gutter from rags to riches. I respect that. And then... Drip Tengu opened his mouth, and within five seconds of him doing so, every ounce of respect I had for bro instantly evaporated from my body because, by golly, Drip Tengu might have just graced us with the worst villain philosophy speech I have ever heard in my life. Now look, I should have known the dude that literally has the word hater engraved on his tongue was going to spit nothing but straight negativity to the highest degree, but I don't think anything could have prepared me for the level of bullshit this man Drip Tengu started spitting because no way he thought we were going to buy that, you guys are the true villains ass speech because it's like bruh you eat people don't talk to me even though hmm, i guess now that i think about it if we're really using that as the indicator for what's evil and what isn't a strong argument can be made for genya being evil and honestly i can accept that bro definitely has a little bit of felon in him i won't lie but leave my boy tanjiro about your gaslighting bro he's a good kid i'm not gonna lie the writers were doing Muichiro too dirty before last week, bruh. Like, from the moment Leaf Tengu blasted my dude into a whole different time zone, things have just been looking real bleak for the Miss Tashira. Like, for starters, these past couple episodes, Muichiro's screen time has been utterly atrocious, bruh. Like, I swear, bro probably got a cool 14 seconds of screen time per episode. And of these 14 seconds, about 12 of them hoes were dedicated to watching this nigga float upside down in a water pot for three weeks straight. Crazy part is, I've been wanting to make a video on Muichido for like a month now, bro. Like, I came into the month of May thinking I was gonna drop some Muichido based bangers on y'all, bro. Like, I was excited. And then three weeks passed of this nigga doing jack sh and I was like, okay. What are we doing here? Like, I won't even hold y'all. It was getting to the point where I would deadass get a little angry whenever they would cut to the Gyoko fight, bruh. Because I already knew there would be zero plot progression happening on my screen if this sloppy body built upper moon was involved. Like, bruh, this fight was so boring, it low-key felt like a commercial break. Like, I was damn near expecting this Gyoko to start telling me to invest in the Gerber Life grow up plan or some shit. Like, come on, bruh. Get it? Because he has, like, baby hands. Nah, okay. Anyway, after weeks and weeks of you foldable selling the bag with Muichiro, I can finally say that these just locked in and got busy because by golly, this fight went absolutely bonkers, bro. Look, I don't know what got into Muichiro recently, but Dog was moving on a whole different type of timing than when we saw him at the beginning of the season because... Hold on. Actually, I do know what got into Muichiro, bro. It was that hot-ass breath that Kotetsu donated him a few episodes back, bro. Ew. Like, I'm not gonna lie, I know that breath was kicking, bro. Because if you ever smelled a child's breath, that sh smells like nothing but straight-up rhinoceros, bro. And I know Kotetsu sh must have really reeked buns because that sh rocked my boy Muichiro so hard that it cured his amnesia and brought his memories back to his head. Like, that's really crazy when you think about it, bro. But anyway, the episode starts off by giving us this sort of long-winded flashback into Muichiro's past, and I mean... Yeah, it was cool, I guess. I'm not really gonna cover his backstory like that in this video because... I don't feel like it. Like, we got cooler shit to talk about, bro. All y'all need to know for the sake of this video is that this nigga Muichido was flashbacking so hard that the god of flashbacks himself, Tanjiro Christ, bestowed upon him his own plot armor birthmark. Now, after Muichido unlocks his plot armor mark, the fight finally starts to get active, and these two felons start running the toughest ones of the season so far. Gyoko starts trying to play Splatoon on these niggas and tries to capture the Mist Hashira and the Swordsmiths and, like, these squid tentacles but Muichiro was not with that slimy sh bro and so he gets right up out of there real quick like he really turned that man's blood demon art into straight sushi bro now at this point it's revealed to us as viewers that Muichiro's swordsmith was somehow able to hand him a whole fresh new sword while they were in the midst of getting jumped in I don't know I guess that plot armor mark was working overtime already bro because let's be real there's no way he should have been able to hand off that sword that fast, bro. But I'm gonna have to let it slide for real. Because this next scene, I'm not gonna lie. This scene right here might be my favorite Demon Slayer scene of all time. Or maybe I just have insane recency bias. But either way, 
that boy Moichido went crazy, bruh. So Gyoko tries to spam those Splatoon tentacles again, but like I said before, Moichido is not with that slimy shit, bro. And so he tells the animators to run his frames up real quick before blitzing that big Gyoko in the coldest scene of the season so far. Now Gyoko just barely manages to dodge this dude's attack. Or so he thought, because when Gyoko started trying to clown Muichido for apparently missing his attack, Muichido hits him with that classic anime delayed slash and then just straight up tells this goop to his face that he's gonna finish him with the next attack. Now look bruv, I'm Gyoko right here. I probably would have pissed in my pot a little bit at this moment because the level of casualness and certainty that this man Muichido spoke with when he declared he was gonna cook Gyoko was actually crazy. And you know what? I can't even say he was capping either because he got right to work too. Gyoko tries to teleport behind him and hit him with another water attack, but this time Muichido was ready and so he weaves the hell out of that sh like it was slight work. He then proceeds to pull a Tanjiro and activate another flashback, which is crazy to me because it's like, bruh, you just had a 20 minute flashback at the beginning of the episode. Like you're already maxed out on flashback plot armor, bro. Calm down. But the thing is, Muichido ain't calming sh** down, bruh, because after being held upside down in a pot for three episodes straight, bro is ready for his get back, and so with the power of childhood trauma and a three trillion dollar animation budget, the Mist Hashira hits Gyoko with the most beautiful slash I've ever seen since like three episodes ago which in the grand scheme of things isn't really that long but still bro this sh was too cold honestly bro the only thing colder than Muichido's performance in this episode gotta be Hazanegu oh how do you even say his name bro Haganezuka 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 honestly bro the only thing colder than Muichido's performance in this episode is Haganezuka's grind bro because this right here might be the grinder of the century bro literally got tapped by a whole upper moon demon and did not flinch once he just kept grinding. Bro literally had his entire workstation obliterated by tentacles out of nowhere. And what was his reaction? More grinding. Like, bro was literally putting his entire soul into this sword, bro. Just for Tanjiro to probably break that shit next season. I'm not gonna lie. Let me find out Tanjiro breaks this sword like he did the last 15 swords he had. And I'm probably gonna have to give away his exact location in Muzan because at this point it's like, nah, bro, I can't stand for that. Like, that's not okay. I'm not even gonna lie to y'all. I think I've probably seen it all this past season of Demon Slayer, bruh. I've seen foreheads the size of basketballs. I've seen mansions that move around like Rubik's Cubes. I've seen a chick fighting with a sword that's actually a whip, that's actually a sword, that's actually a whip, that's actually... Like, I've seen it all. But out of all the crazy shit I've seen during this season of Demon Slayer, nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to see in last week's episode, y'all. Because no way I just watched a Hashira and a whole upper moon demon stop the swordplay for half an episode just to engage in a roast battle and like i don't mean your typical anime oh i'm so much stronger than you type roast battle nah bro i'm talking a full-on school cafeteria style jamboree of these niggas cooking each other for their immutable characteristics like there wasn't no breathing styles going on there wasn't no blood demon art it was just straight packs and disrespect bro and the crazy part is i won't even lie to y'all like 90 percent of these roasts were coming from uichido's mouth bro like the boy gyoko simply could not hang low key bro now that i think about it looking back i feel like that's the real reason why muichido was sitting up in that water pot for so long bro like he must have been in like he must have been in that pre-planning all the roast he was about to drop on Gyoko because when the time came bro he really started slinging the most intricate well thought out insults without a single hesitation or a single stutter like I'm not gonna lie bro as far as I'm concerned the boy Muichiro ain't even the mist Hashira anymore bro bro's mist has officially evolved into smoke just based solely off of how hard he smoked this Gyoko with that said moving forward we will henceforth refer to this man Muichiro as the smoke Hashira. So the scene picks up where we left off in the last episode. <laughs> Damn. So the scene picks up where we left off in the last episode. The boy Gyoko had somehow lucked out again and managed to weave Muichido's attack. And so now he's like sitting on top of this little tree looking down on Muichido. Now while Gyoko's up on this tree, he starts spitting the sort of typical anime villain speech that they give when their back's against the wall. You know, the whole don't underestimate me type speech. I'm not gonna lie, when I first saw this, I expected Muichido to come back at him with like a Honestly, I don't know what type of energy I expected him to be on. Like, I don't think I really expected Muichido to say much of anything since he normally seems like the stoic, quiet type. But I'll tell you this, I definitely didn't expect him to pop out with the level of smoke that he did. Like, he basically looked this man Gyoko dead in the eyes or <coughs> dead in the <coughs> mouths, maybe. Yeah, I don't really know which part of Gyoko you'd make eye contact with. But anyway, he looks this fish man dead in his sh and just tells him straight up, Hey, bro, I'm not even underestimating you or anything. I'm just spitting facts, bro. Like, it's really up for you. Now, obviously, Gyoko doesn't take too kindly to this disrespect. And so he starts trying to roost Muichido back. And I'm not even gonna lie to y'all. Gyoko was actually tight funny with this shit, 
bro. He said Boichiro's arms were too short to scrap and that he probably couldn't even reach his neck because he had a baby sword. But you already know the smoke Hashira couldn't stand for that disrespect, bro. And so he had to press down on Gyoko like, hey, bro, that's real crazy that you say that because didn't I put you in an AMV last episode? Oh, all right, then shut your bitch ass up. And your pot's ugly as hell, by the way. Now, you know how everyone has that like... <laughs> Look, y'all, I had to pop out with the young inhaler because this shit was getting out of hand, bro. <laughs> Now, you know how everyone has that, like, one forbidden topic that you can't roast them on or else shit will start to get real serious? Yeah, well, I guess for Gyoko, that topic is his pots. Because the moment Muichiro starts talking down on his pottery skills, that boy Gyoko basically says, fuck a pack session, bruh, cash these hands, and starts to scrap right back up again. So Gyoko pulls out another set of magical pots and tries to hit Muichiro with, like, the anchovies from Spongebob, but Muichiro gives them little guppies to work and destroys, like, all 10,000 of them hoes in a single blow. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Them plot on remarks on his face got my boy Muichiro moving different, bruh. The smoke Kostra then proceeds to try to speed blitz Gyoko and take off his dome, but Gyoko literally sheds his skin and leaves his pot to avoid the attack, which... I just think it's kind of funny. Like, I have this headcanon that Gyoko secretly left the pot because he got self-conscious after Moichido flamed this sh And, like, when you think about it from that perspective, bruh, it's low-key hilarious because that would be like if a nigga roasted your kicks to school and then you came back to school the next day entirely barefoot. Like, this man Gyoko got roasted so hard that he basically said, bruh, f*** a pot, bro. I'ma just start slithering and sh Anyway, in the process of leaving his pot, Gyoko actually reveals his final form, which is like this giant snake mermaid sort of thing and i'm not even gonna lie what the f was bro cooking with this vinyl form like i don't have that much of a problem with the form itself i'm more so curious about who the f thought this blood demon art was a good idea bro essentially this man's blood demon art is the power to turn anything he punches into quote unquote fresh fish like there's a point where his knuckles graze moichido and like the part of his shirt that got hit turned into like sardines or some sh like, bro, I'm sorry, but you can't tell me that shit isn't about nasty as hell, bro. Like, I'm not gonna lie, if I'm Muzan, I'm making Gyoko go back to the lab and come up with some new shit, bro. Because I feel like this whole fish theme he got going on, like, it's real sloppy, real slimy, and it's kind of getting out of hand. So, like, yeah, let's fix that up, bro. Anyway, the smoke Smokashiri goes back to running the ones with Gyoko, and I'm not gonna lie, he's basically just trolling Gyoko at this point. Like, he's out there playing Made You Look with this nigga. He's out there dropping literal troll faces on, bro, like... This trolling is getting flagrant at this point, bruh. Just please hurry up and end this sh Hmm, you said end it? Oh, alright. Best. Now, it's not until after Gyoko gets his head chopped off that we see what just might be peak disrespect in Demon Slayer. Like, I don't know if I'm just used to Tanjiro coddling demons after he slaughters them, but the way Moichiro chops this nigga Gyoko into a 20-piece McNugget... I don't know, something felt extra vile about that right there, bruh. Like, seeing this low-key got me wondering, do y'all think, like, we got the right Tokido sibling, bruh? Because Moichido seemed nice as shit as a kid, and like, I don't know, this seemed like some hater-ass shit the older brother would do. Like, bro was roasting so hard, Rengoku had to pop out in his dreams and congratulate him on the flames. Like, that's crazy. The, f the flame Hashira congratulating you on your flames? That's not crazy to y'all? It's gotta be the older brother, bruh. I'm not gonna lie, I know Hintengu probably about mad as hell right now, and honestly, can you really blame him? Because I feel like getting third-partied by a whole Hashira is already a crazy way to go out on its own, but getting jumped with literally two episodes left in the season is simply the devil's work, bro, and you cannot convince me otherwise. Like, a part of me is just over here wondering what the hell the girl Mitsuri was getting into these past couple episodes that got her showing up this late to the scrap, because I know she wasn't out there boxing, bro. Earlier in the season, we watched her literally eviscerate a giant fish zombie in like two seconds flat, so if we're going by that math, it's reasonable to say that if she wanted to, she probably could have handled all of Gyoko's fish army in like a minute and a half or something. Now, I know the passage of time can be a little wonky in anime with, like, seconds in universe taking literal episodes to pass sometimes, but I know more than a minute and a half's worth of time had to have passed after six weeks of content, bro. Like, I swear we done watched the Gehen Tengu clone himself about 30 times before Mitsuri even clocked in for the night. Like, I'm not gonna lie, Tanjiro getting his ass beat must have just been a canon event, bro. And Miguel must have told Mitsuri she can't step in to save him because that's the only way I could possibly justify the level of L-mans that Mitsuri has displayed by showing up tardy to a literal upper moon squabble. Hey, uh, real quick, if you want to help me continue to overreact to fictional characters on a weekly basis, consider subscribing to my Patreon. It would really help a lot. No pressure, though. Of course. Anyway, regardless of how L-Mans meet Sirius for showing up this late to the scrap, I can't even hold y'all. 
it's better she showed up late than never, bro. Because old girl jumped up in this bitch like she got something to prove, bro. Essentially, Drip Tingu made the mistake of calling her a quote unquote shameless tramp, which is, I guess, basically just the olden day way of saying you a hoe. And yeah, from that insult forward, Mitsuri just started turning up on this bro. Like, she was really locked in on whooping this man's ass. And Tengu tries to hit Mitsuri with basically everything he got in his inventory, bro. Like, I swear this nigga must have paused mid scrap to check his move list, because he was really out here spamming attacks from all different elements. Like, his name was secretly Avatar Aang. Actually, nah, I can't even do my boy Aang like that. Like, at best, I can maybe give bro Korra. <sighs> I can't even really do Korra like that for real. Avatar Roku, take it or leave it, bro. And Tengu tries to hit her with, like, this lightning slash sound attack, which is like really dumb by the way because why would you use your sound waves as a means to transport your lightning bolts that's just gonna make the lightning move slower dumbass but anyway yeah she swats that dumb shit out the way like it's light work and tingu then proceeds to try to hit her with the wind attack that leave tingu was spamming a couple episodes back but mitsuri dodges that shit like it's light work as well honestly that shit was so slight to her she actually takes the opportunity to sprinkle in a little extra disrespect and so instead of just dodging the attack normally she gets to doing somersaults and a whole bunch of extra shit just to make Hentengu look even dumber, I guess. Now, at this point, I guess Hentengu is about sick of her shit, bruh, because he basically starts button mashing his drums to get, like, 20 wood dragons to jump her all at once. Yeah, she one-shots them hoes, too. All of them. At once. Honestly, it was kind of sad to watch, bro. Like, I know this guy Tengu was really fiending for another transformation to come bail him out, but I think he finally maxed out the battle pass, bro. Like, I think we're finally done seeing Hentengu pop out with a new skin every two episodes. Like, I don't know. Bro's gonna have to go beg Muzan for some DLC to his Blood Demon art or something. I don't know. Anyway, at this point, I guess Mitsuri must have started feeling herself, bro, because she makes the decision to go for the finishing blow, right? So she runs up on Hentengu and, like, wraps her sword around his neck. The only problem here is that because she skipped the past five goddamn episodes, she was entirely unaware of the fact that the body she was fighting was not the body she was supposed to be trying to kill and so Hentengu basically plays her like a fiddle bro he waits for her to get to close range before screeching in her ear like a maniac and just knocking her out in the process now i'm not even gonna lie to y'all Hentengu really should have caught the dub here like mitsuri really has no business still being alive right now like the boy Hentengu was literally half a second away from splattering her dome across the pavement with his bare knuckles But luckily for the love Hashira, Tan Jesus Christ decided to bless her up with, you guessed it, a plot armor flashback. I'm not gonna go too in depth with Mitsuri's flashback just for like, the sake of time I guess. What I do want to say though is that Uba Yashiki, you dead wrong for risen up this innocent young lady at the lowest point in her life just so she would join your suicide squad. Like if she really wanted a place where she could just be buff, have pink hair, and eat a lot of food, I don't know, she could have joined the circus or some shit started a tiktok account i don't know i just know that she really doesn't gotta be out here risking her life on a day-to-day -day basis but hey i respect the public service i guess anywho mitsuri wakes up from her flashback with the power of plot armor and cheat codes coursing through her veins she actually unlocks her plot armor mark just like moichido did a couple episodes back and i'm just wondering where was these plot armor marks at when niggas really needed them during the akaza fight like were they just out of stock did y'all check the back like I don't know, it's looking a little suspicious to me. Anywho, if you thought Mitsuri was getting saucy on this nigga Tengu before, I promise you, you ain't even seen nothing yet, bro. Because once she was amped up, she starts giving Hantengu the most atrocious fade I've ever seen in my life, bro. Honestly, bro, if I'm Hantengu right here, the moment I see this woman body check one of my dragons and stop it in his tracks, psh, yeah, all right, you got that, bro. It's time to pack it up, y'all. There are a few essential experiences that every shonen MC has to go through before their story ends. Take for example, the death of a mentor. Oh and god, you can't name me one MC in a shonen story that hasn't had a mentor die because that's just how things go in these shonen streets, bruh. Think of it as a canon event, if you will. Another one of these canon events, perhaps my favorite of the shonen tropes, is the rage moment. During the rage moment, a shonen MC will temporarily tap into a once unforeseen level of power due to the intensity of their sheer unbridled rage. A rage that usually follows an extremely traumatizing experience, including but not limited to the death of a loved one, the almost death of a loved one, the I finally stopped being delusional and I've now accepted that this nigga kite is actually permanently dead of a loved one. Y'all get the idea. I bring this trope up though because as far as this last episode is concerned, I think the boy Tanjo has finally reached his rage moment, bro. Like, I think Hantengu finessing death for the 50th time just sent my boy over the edge because Tanjo was not playing with that fat dome ass anymore, bro. Honestly, bro, this nigga Tanjo was moving with a level of flagrancy that I didn't even know he had in him, bro. Like, is this really the same Tanjo that used to pray over demons before he killed him? Like, honestly, bro, is dog okay? Look, I don't know if they got like 
therapists or like mental health professionals in the Demon Slayer core. But I'm not gonna lie, someone might gotta lock me in with Uba Yashiki, bruh. Cause look, I had this idea, right? You know how they have like a swordsmith village filled with nothing but swordsmiths that work solely for the Demon Slayer core? Okay, okay, hear me out, hear me out. What if we did the same thing, but instead of swordsmith village, it's therapist village? Cause bro, I'm gonna keep it a buck right now. Most of these Hashira would be out here running fade with the wrong demons, bro. Like, bro, f*** a upper moon. Are you good? Like, are you mentally and spiritually healthy right now? Like, okay, f physical health, because I know you're fine in that department, buff body built ass nigga. But, like, do you need to talk? Like, I'm not gonna lie. If I'm Ubu Yashiki, almost all of these Hashira are gonna have to take at least a week-long visit to Therapist Village, bro. In fact, let's go down the line of Hashira and see who I'm a force to go immediately and who gets to, like, I don't know, go at their own leisure or whatever. You, your emo ass most definitely gotta go. You... You're dead, so it doesn't really make a difference. You, I'ma let you slide, but I still think it would help you out a lot. So take what you will out of that. You, I don't really know you yet, but you wear a snake around your neck like it's Cuban links. We gotta talk that out, bro. I'll see you in therapy. You, I feel like you're good to be honest. I'ma let you slide. <laughs> yeah, I, you, you've always given me confusing vibes. So I'ma just play it safe and say you should probably go. You, bruh therapy you need to take your ass to school little bro did you ever learn how to count to 50 you i don't really know you like that either but you seem to have things under control so i'm gonna let you slide tell your little homie genya though that he simply must attend therapist village bro because eating your ops is still not okay anyway uh it seems i got a little distracted here so yeah let's get back to the episode at hand now as cool as the tanjiro rage moment was for a like me who loves flashy animation and intense scraps i'm not gonna sit here and act like tanjiro didn't bullshit his way to victory here on three separate occasions like i can understand having one bullshit power up or one plot armor moment that leads you to victory but three separate instances of bullshit in one episode is simply excessive bro like i'm not gonna lie at this point bro Tanjiro's gotta start demonstrating some more respect for his ops, bro, because he's not even running a fair fade anymore. He's just letting his main character nuts drag all over the face of his enemies by manipulating the plot however he pleases. So, yeah, let's take a look at these three bullshit moments that Tanjiro activated to spaz on Hentengu. Bullshit moment number one. Tanjiro, Nezuko, and Genya are all chasing Tiny Tengu through the woods, right? And I'm not even gonna lie to y'all, Tiny Tengu was most definitely giving these is the jets bro like there was honestly no way these three were gonna catch him especially because tanjiro who was the fastest of the three had busted his leg already now it's at this point that tanjiro decides to activate a flashback to which i was like okay you know typical tanjiro type sh i assume maybe he was activating a flashback for like a little power boost i don't know but then i started to really watch the flashback and i was like bruh why is bro flashing back to the homie zenitsu like what are we doing here now look you can call me a hater you can say what you gotta say but stealing your man's flow from out of a flashback gotta be a new level of hacking bro because no way you expect me to believe that tanjiro kamado a dude who has never breathed a damn of thunder in his life before is suddenly a proficient thunder breather after a mere singular flashback but regardless of what i think tanjiro ran up on this man hantengu with the thunder breathing first form followed by a sun breathing and yeah he got to work on hantengu kinda he actually didn't manage to kill Hentengu right here because the little dude had some hacks of his own up his sleeve and like he turned big or whatever but this actually takes us to our second bullshit moment, the Nezuko moment. Which I'm actually gonna save for the next video because yeah I have some words for Little Miss Plot Device over here so we're just gonna skip past the whole Nezuko stuff for now and fast forward to the end of the Hentengu fight and the third bullshit moment the Sharingan moment. Okay, so look, after all the Nezuko stuff, which we're not gonna speak on yet, Tanjiro finds himself in a race against time to save these three swordsmiths from Hantengu, who is still somehow alive after literally having his dome chopped off by another thunder-breathing, sun-breathing combo. Actually, bro, now that I say it out loud, I do low-key think that Hantengu has been hacking harder than Tanjiro has this whole season. So honestly, can I really blame Tanjiro for hacking back just as hard? Yes, I can. Because no way this activated a whole Sharingan to figure out where Hentengu was hiding. Like, let me guess, bro. He smelled Hentengu's body and saw him hiding in there, huh? That's what we doing now, huh? We smelling rib cages and heartbeats? Like, come on, bro. How is that fair? I will say, though, regardless of all the hacker cheater moments it took to get there, the animation in the scene where Tanjiro slayed Hentengu went bananas, bro. Like, the utter enrage that was embedded in Tanjiro's slashes had me getting up out my seat like I was watching this shit courtside, bro. Like, I'm not gonna lie. They had me swinging my imaginary sword and shit like I was about to get in the middle and start putting some slashes on Hantengu myself. Like, real talk, all hating and jokes aside, you foldable definitely ate this episode up, bruh. Yeah. So you trying to tell me that this fat-ass nodule on Hantengu's dome isn't the result of demonic shenanigans, but rather the result of pure genetics? Like, you trying to tell me that he had this dastardly knot on his sh since his human days? I'm not gonna lie, with a dome like that, bruh, 
and Tengu was simply destined for weird sh Like, I wonder what would have happened if Tanjiro only cut off his lump, bro. Like, I bet Hentengu probably would have turned to a good guy from that point forward simply out of pure gratitude. Shit, I know I'd be gratuitous. <laughs> bro, saved my whole life, bruh. All he gotta do now is fix my hairline. Nezuko has always been an interesting case to me because... <coughs> Damn, here we go with the asthma shit again. Nezuko has always been an interesting case to me because I've never really known how to feel about the existence of her character. On one hand, she is the literal driving force between why the story of Demon Slayer exists. The Tanjiro would not be out here cracking his cranium against demon chest meat on a daily basis if Nezuko did not get demonified at the beginning of the story. Like, I don't think it's a reach to say that apart from Tanjiro and maybe Muzan, Nezuko is literally the most important character to the story of Demon Slayer at least from like a plot perspective. On the other hand though, it's like, although I recognize her importance to the progression of the plot, does she do anything else besides progress the plot? Like I feel like Nezuko is low-key the most done dirty character in this whole series because the concept of a demon that doesn't eat people opens up so much opportunity for exploration, yet the series literally shoves a muzzle in her mouth and throws her into a f***ing box to be off screen until Tanjiro or one of the homies is in trouble. Now I know I make a lot of jokes clowning on Demon Slayer, but most of the things I clown on Demon Slayer for in these videos, I really don't care about enough to hold against the series. Oh, Tanjiro has so much plot armor. Oh, the story is so predictable. Yeah, I don't give a f shut the f up and watch these f***ing frames bitch. did you just see that nigga combine lightning and sun flames at the same time i don't care if it was some bullshit that shit went hard like i'm a firm believer in the idea that not every piece of media in the world has to have some deeper meaning or some philosophical thesis behind it just to be considered good sometimes i just want to turn off my brain and watch an angry nigga kill an ugly nigga with pretty flames and if that's wrong Bro, I don't want to be right. Demon Slayer has excelled with providing me visually impressive and emotionally engaging content over the past couple months. And despite its flaws, I'ma always give it a little glaze just for doing so. With that said though, as much as I consciously and actively let Demon Slayer slide in a lot of its aspects that I see a lot of people understandably being critical of, nigga, I can't let this Nezuko sh slide no more, bro. Because what the f- Nezuko had one singular weakness as a demon, the sun. That was it. She could already nullify his powers on some real hacker cheater shit. She could already throw hands with the best of them or throw toes in her case since she just loves to stomp a nigga out. She could already grow, shrink, regenerate, blood manipulate, and now she's immune to the sun? Bro, how is that fair? She's literally just a superhero now. That's all there is to it. Nezuko finessing the sun during that finale episode was the tipping point for my disdain with the way the story handled her character because, well for one, they off screen that sh which was really whack because now I'm sitting here left to imagine that while Tanjiro was big bodying Hantengu in a literal character defining rage moment, Nezuko just casually went from listening to my mixtape to getting up, walking in the sun, and telling his good morning like she just cooked them some fing turkey sausage. But beyond just the fact that they off screen what is arguably the most impactful moment in the series so far, I think Nezuko conquering the sun in the first place is just a crazy way to entirely eviscerate a lot of the stakes that the story had in the first place. Like, I'm gonna keep it a buck with y'all right now. If I'm Tanjiro and I see Nezuko walking in the sun and talking to me again, I'm putting the sword down right then and there, bro. Throwing that shit right back to Muichido, and you will never see me breathe a damn of Hinokami in my life ever again. I'm finna go retire with Tengen in them, and I don't know, he could teach me the ways of the Riz or some shit, because the fuck I look like running a squabble with Demon King Muzan if my sister can frolic in the sun. One can argue that as a demon that can live in the sun, she is actually better off than she was as an original human, so like, honestly, at this point, I don't know, bro. I feel like reverting her back to her human form would low-key be doing a bit of a disservice to her. Like, bro, I apologize. I'm sorry. Sorry to the Hashiro for tapping out like this. I hope y'all know y'all got my full support from the sidelines, but at this point, I don't know, bruh. I might just have to pull a Rengoku's dad and just say to hell with all this bullshit, bruh. Rengoku's dad and I will just be like, I don't know, over here on the sidelines, slamming down them lean jugs he be sipping to forget about how they did my boy Rengoku. Rest in peace. Like, y'all are locked in plot armor marks though, so, you know, y'all be alright. Be easy out there. They said that Godoma was pretty strong, so, you know. Hey, real quick, if you want to help me recover from the loss of Rengoku and to continue to put out vids like this one, consider subscribing to my Patreon. It would really help a lot. No pressure though, of course. But nah, jokes aside for a sec, I think the reason that Nezuko conquering the sun bothers me so much is because I feel like overall, Little Miss Plot Armor finessing the sun is reflective of a constantly recurring pattern that this series has where it just continually uses Nezuko's existence as a convenient method to erase the consequences of his actions. Like Tengen and Inosuke sacrificing themselves to defeat an upper moon was actually a really touching moment. Until it wasn't because Nezuko erased the part where they actually had to sacrifice themselves. Nezuko choosing the lives of three innocent swordsmiths over her own was an extremely admirable thing to do. 
until she was just like, psych, nah, I actually don't want to die yet, so I simply will not. And then she just did it. Like, come on, bro, you can't do the whole trolley problem. Would you rather save your own sister or the lives of three innocent people? And then be like, psych, bro, you forgot about the secret option three. Save everyone and then have a big giant group hug. Yay! Okay, I'm hating a little too hard right now. Like, let me chill out for real because as much as I was kind of irked by Nezuko finessing the sun, I'm not going to sit here and act like nothing good came out of this moment, bro. Like, I can admit, even though this moment wasn't my cup of tea storytelling-wise, there were some genuinely compelling things to come from this scene. For starters, regardless of what you think about the ramifications of Nezuko finessing the sun, I think it's only fair to give you foldable a little glazy glaze for the way they handled this scene, bro. No, I don't like the fact that Nezuko finessed the sun, but yes, I did let out one singular tear during this scene simply due to how well you foldable handled it all the music in the environment were utterly pristine that sunrise looked prettier than any sunrise i have ever seen in real life bro that lighting was insane bro like this is the first lighting i ever seen in my life that gives anyone it touches light skin abilities do you know how op your lighting gotta be to make the ginya look good exactly bro that is some good ass lighting. Also, now that I think about it, another good thing to come out of Nezuko conquering the sun is like Muzan having an actual, tangible, valid reason for wanting to smoke the Tanjiro. Like before Nezuko conquered the sun, the literal singular reason that Muzan had for wanting to kill Tanjiro was the fact that Tanjiro kind of reminded him of a he got spanked by 500 years ago. He was literally giving Tanjiro 500 years worth of beef over some damn earrings. That's not he, bro. At least now Muzan wants to steal Nezuko's body, which, albeit very weird, is a much better villain goal than killing your biggest ops, great, 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 grand homie. Like, 